Well, thank you for joining us for our uh, class. And you should have finished your quiz by now from the last time. Each session you should take the quiz from the week before, and then I'll start in again. In this session, we're going to talk about dinosaurs that are still alive. This is my normally seminar part 3B. And I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground tonight instead of chasing too many rabbits because I have spent 20 years studying this topic of dinosaurs that are still alive. I suspect I've read 300 books on this topic. I've read every one I can find at all of the major libraries I've gone to to research this. If you go to the library, if it's on the Dewey system, you go to 001.9, and you'll find books on what's called cryptozoology. Cryptozoology, be a good quiz question there, Becky, is the study of hidden animals. Crypto means hidden. Zoology is study of animals. So the study of hidden animals, or animals that are very rarely seen, would be cryptozoology. The... Uh, the man who made up this term, cryptozoology, is Bernard Heuvelmans, who is a French scientist, and he has been a longtime president of the Cryptozoology Society. They study lots of things besides just Loch Ness Monster type things. They would also study Bigfoot, um, not too much in UFOs, but mostly animals that are still alive. And so there have been, <clears throat> according to Bernard Heuvelmans, 20,000 reported sightings of dinosaurs in this century. Just in the last 100 years, there have been 20,000 people that claim they've seen a live dinosaur. Now, there's no question some of them are frauds, you know, mistaken identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's just talk about this. Is it possible that some dinosaurs could still be alive? What I point out in my seminar is that I think we've got overwhelming evidence that dinosaurs have always lived with man. They're called dragons through most of history. And there are certainly a lot of artifacts found, human and dinosaur artifacts together, human and dinosaur footprints together, but none of that is necessary if dinosaurs are still alive. And I think there's quite a bit of evidence that some are still around. We're going to try to cover that as much as possible in one class and then go on into uh, lies in the textbooks for our next one. But uh, So I'm going to have to just cut it off in the middle and say, okay, research on your own. If you want to read some books, we have a half a dozen books in our catalog that deal with this topic. One that I wrote with William Gibbons called Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. It would be a, just a cheap uh, $5 book you could get and covers a lot of information on dinosaurs still living. Most of the authors on cryptozoology are evolutionists. And it's really funny to read what they say. They will do all this interesting research on dinosaurs are still living, and they go through all these sightings and stories, and then they say, wow, it's amazing. Some survive for 70 million years. So they come to the wrong conclusion after all of that. The right conclusion is, no, the world is not 70 million years old. God made it 6,000 years ago. There was a canopy above the atmosphere when God first made it. Increased air pressure. Dinosaurs lived with man during this time. We covered in the last few classes about the Ica stones. Who remembers how many Ica stones have been found? Over 50,000, right. 50,000 of these stones found in Ica, Peru, 56,000 more found in Mexico, and they have humans and dinosaurs carved on them together. And here the textbooks are teaching the kids that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and yet we have art, we have artifacts, we have evidence that man and dinosaurs have lived together. I think probably there's a bigger picture we need to look at here. Satan hates humanity. He wants to send people to hell. And he wants his one world government, new world order. In order to accomplish that, he has to have people believing in evolution. Uh, that's his theme. It's what he started off tricking Eve with. He said, you can be like God if you do what I say. And the whole idea that man can somehow be God started, of course, with Satan in the Garden of Eden. And he's used that same lie all through history. And it's why let up. It's worked great. you know. And it's still going on here toward the end of time teaching everybody that man can be like God. So dinosaurs are one of his favorite tools to use because he can use dinosaurs and teach four-year-olds about evolution, kids that can't even read yet. Get a bunch of four-year-olds together and hold up some dinosaurs and ask them the question, when did dinosaurs live? Instantly they will shout out, millions of years ago, and they don't even know what millions is. But they've already been brainwashed because of the TV, because of the books like this one. I can read about dinosaurs. A book for little kids. First sentence says, millions of years ago. 
Same thing in Ukraine. They teach this over there using dinosaurs millions of years ago. Every country I've gone to, I see the same thing in the kids' books. They use dinosaurs to teach them evolution. Here's a Dr. Seuss book. Millions of years before you were born. Down in the bottom right-hand corner. Well, now, just hold on a minute. Is the Earth millions of years old? Well, of course, we know it's not. But all the books on dinosaurs, nearly all of them that I see, say millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the Earth. And it's really tragic, I think, that we have allowed this to happen in the last 150 years. What happened? In 1841, when they made up the word dinosaur, many people at that time were teaching the Earth is millions of years old, and it's the same. Several things happened simultaneously. The invention of the geologic column, which we'll get into on uh, seminar part four, the idea that the layers of Earth are different age. Darwin's theory, 1859, Dinosaurs being discovered in the early 1800s and people not knowing where to put them. Here's these massive reptiles are being found, the bones of them, and the average Christian or average layman didn't know how to put them in history. And so it was Satan's golden opportunity to come in and say, they lived millions of years ago, and Christians, instead of fighting it, swallowed it and accepted it. And there are some Christians today that accept it and teach the same thing. And they try to make dinosaurs millions of years ago fit into the Bible, and it just doesn't fit. They try to, you know, with the gap theory and all that stuff we went through before. Here we come to Job chapter 40. The Bible says this animal, Behemoth, lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. Fens is an old English word that means the swamp. Behemoth lives in the swamp. Well, the largest swamp in the world today is in the central part of Africa. It's called the Likawala Swamp. So that would be a good quiz question. What's the largest swamp in the world? The Likawala Swamp is over 55,000 square miles. That makes it larger than the entire state of Arkansas. Arkansas is 53,000 square miles. The state of Florida is 55,000 square miles. So is Illinois and Iowa. Each of those three states are about the same size. That swamp is as big as any one of those states. It's huge. Most Americans don't understand the size of uh, Africa. So here's a map showing Africa and America together. It is just simply gigantic. That swamp is bigger than any one of those yellow states on our map here. The same size as the three red ones. In 1885, Belgium, right next to France, you know, Belgium came down and colonized the Congo. In the late 1800s, many uh, advanced countries, for lack of a better word, were colonizing other countries. That's a nice way of saying they were hiring their people for a nickel a day to get all their gold and minerals and diamonds. You know, they were robbing these countries of all their valuables and enslaving them, basically. But they called it colonization. Anyway, the Belgians ruled this country for about um, 75 years. And as some of the older folks will remember, when you're in school, they taught you about the Belgian Congo. This was the name of this country, Belgian Congo, until 1960, when the communists went in there and liberated them. You know how the communists liberate a country. <laughs> you know how they liberated Ukraine, you know, killed 10 million people and said, okay, you're free now. Uh, but... The communists liberated them, and now it's called People's Republic of Congo. But for 75 years, it was called the Belgian Congo. Explorers from Belgium and other countries went into that swamp. After all, they'd taken over this territory. You know, let's see what we have here. Looking for gold and diamonds or whatever. In 1910, this article appeared in the New York Herald. Is a brontosaurus roaming Africa's wilds? Now, at this time, the Brontosaurus had just been discovered before that. There were two groups, a guy named Cope, C-O-P-E, and a guy named Marsh, M-A-R-S-H. They were two fossil hunters that were in competition with each other. And they had crews that would go out all over scouring the West trying to find dinosaur bones and dig them out and bring them back and put them together in museums. They each worked for different museums. I think one was for Harvard and one was for American Museum in New York or something like that. Anyway. They had this tremendous competition to go out and look for these dinosaur bones to put them in the museums. They got in a hurry to put one together, put together this big dinosaur they found, but it didn't have a head. So some guy got a head from four and a half miles away, brought it in, they stuck it on the dinosaur, and called it a brontosaurus. Most of the dinosaur names come from Latin words. Brontosaurus is thunder lizard from Latin. And they said he was so big when he walked, the ground would shake, you know, so they call him the Thunder Lizard, Brontosaurus. Many years later, they discovered it was the wrong head. 
there never was a Brontosaurus. They had the body of a Diplodocus and the head of an Apatosaurus. It's not a big mistake. I mean, it's sort of like putting together bones of a, of a dog and you don't have a head. You say you put together the bones of a Chihuahua and you find you don't have a head, so you put the head on there from a Great Dane. Well, they're both dogs, but there's no such thing as a Great Chihuahua. So uh, there's no such thing as a Brontosaurus. It was a mix-up, but it's okay to use the term. If you watch Fred Flintstone, you know, he drives a Brontosaurus, and they eat Bronto burgers, and that's all from the Brontosaurus. And so in 1910, they did not know about the mistake yet. It had just been put together, I think, in 1890 or something like that, and it was several years before they discovered it was the wrong head. So this article came out and said, Is a Brontosaurus roaming Africa's wilds? This is in the New York newspaper. Because so many people had gone in there and come out saying, you know, we saw a dinosaur in there, still alive. Now, I think the Lord always has his witness and his testimony in, in things. And here we have people, scientists and teachers all over the world teaching, you know, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago in the early 1900s. And persistently these rumors start popping up and dinosaurs still living. Just to give, you know, the the Christians some, some hope that, hey, maybe the Bible is indeed the Word of God, and it's right. 1948, this article appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. Now, the Saturday Evening Post was a major magazine in the early 40s and late 40s, sort of like Time Magazine or National Geographic or something like that. This article is three, uh, three pages about dinosaurs still living. It goes through people who've gone in there and say, look, I saw one gives their testimonies in this article, January 3rd edition of Saturday Evening Post, back from 1948. By the way, if anybody can get me an original copy of this, what I have, I found one at a library where they actually had the original magazine, 1948 Saturday Evening Post. And I photocopied the pages out of there, and it was a very lousy photocopy, so all I have is a lousy copy of the original. I would like to find somebody who has an original and buy it off them. So if you come across one, <laughs> let me know. Uh, a South African big game hunter named... Um, uh, Mr. Gobbler, good name for a game hunter, I suppose, uh, returned from a trip to Angola and announced to the Cape Town newspaper that the Cape Argus was the name of the paper, that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur, dwelling in the Dilolo swamps and known to the natives as the Chippequi. It has the head and tail of a lizard. Ivan Sanderson, who wrote the article that we mentioned earlier, uh, There Could Be Dinosaurs, from the Saturday Evening Post, this quote is from that article. Ivan Sanderson was quite an explorer and collector of sightings like this and stories. And he really uh, has some amazing reports he's done on this. And again, we could spend the rest of the rest of my lifetime talking about reports of dinosaurs still living. So I, I want you to research it for yourself if you want. Go to 001.9 or if it's the uh, Library of Congress system, it's QL89, like Queen and then Larry89, and you will find books on the this topic, okay? Uh, people in Central African Republic call it Naguri. That's their uh, name for it. Different missionaries that I meet all over the world tell me, oh, yeah, we've got one of those in our country. The natives talk about it. But they all, of course, have a different name for it. In some parts of Africa, in the swamp, as you travel around, they will speak a different language. Some people call these creatures uh, Chippequi. Some call it Yalama. They have different regional names for it, depending on their, their vocabulary. Well, Dr. Roy Mackle from the University of Chicago and decided to go to the swamp. He had been involved in studying cryptozoology for many years, and he'd read all these stories of dinosaurs still living, and he was a microbiology professor at the University of Chicago. He said, well, a good scientist, uh, and you hear something, you check it out. So, you know, thankfully, he was honest enough to say, okay, I don't think it's true, but let's go check it out. Now, you have to understand, if you got a bunch of scientists together and said, let's go to the North Pole and look for Santa Claus, What's going on in their mind? Why spend all that money? We know it can't be true. It's a waste of money. That's exactly the way many scientists feel when you say, let's go to Africa and look for living dinosaurs. Because in their mind, it's already been settled. We know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Why waste all that money and go look for them? It can't be true. So their, their teaching, their philosophy of evolution hinders them even thinking down this track that there could be some still alive because of what they've been taught. Okay, so anyway, Roy Mackle did go with uh, Powell, uh, I forgot, James Powell, I believe his name was, a crocodile expert, and they went to the Laqualla Swamp. This is from the book uh, Time Life Mysterious Creatures, part of the Time Life series, one of the big books they have. 
showing a picture of them tromping through the swamp. They said it's the most miserable swamp in the world. Uh, mosquitoes landed on them at the rate of 1,000 per hour the entire time they're there. Bloodthirsty mosquitoes, snakes, bugs. Uh, you, need, you need to understand also this is a communist country now. So the communists have gone back in there to these swampy areas and told the villagers, boy, if you ever see a white man, he's probably a communist, he's probably a spy against the communists, you know, go ahead and kill him. <laughs> Very unsafe place to go. Uh, Mark Miller went there and wrote a neat article about how he just about was killed by the pygmies because they thought he was some kind of spy. Um, but in the book, The Living Dinosaur, written by Roy Mackle, after going into the swamp, he tells about the Mahamba, the giant uh, crocodile that the natives report that lives in the swamp that gets to 50 feet long. One group of scientists in 19... Um, I don't remember the date now. 1984, I believe, claims that they saw a Mahamba a 50-foot crocodile. This room is 34 feet long, so that's a big crocodile. The natives talk about the animal called Mokele Mbembe, which is their pronunciation of the creature. Mokele Mbembe means, I believe it means stopper of rivers. On page 225 of Mackel's book, he shows this sketch that he would show to the natives, and they would say, oh yeah, that's Mokele Mbembe. He lives out in the swamp. Mackle tells in his book how he tried, as a scientist, to, to make sure he wasn't leading the natives to answer a question. He would go to some villages, and he would just mention the name. He would say, what is Mokele Mbembe? And they would draw a sketch on the ground with a stick, and they'd draw a picture of a dinosaur with a long neck and a long tail. Other villages, he would show them a picture and say, what is this? And they would say, oh, that's Mokele Mbembe. Now, it's a very superstitious region over there, and... Uh, a friend of mine who was there for, Gene Thomas, was there for 42 years. I just talked to him three days ago. He said, Well, Hovind, you have to understand, the people here are very superstitious. And they, some of them believe that if you even mention the name Mokele Mbembe, you will die. So if a person goes into this area and says, What about Mokele Mbembe? They may say, Oh, never heard of it. Because they're afraid of dying for saying its name or for talking about it because they're very superstitious people. But Mackel went there and spent a lot of money on two expeditions. Uh, he says the animals live underwater most of the time. They're mostly active at night, which makes them even harder to see, obviously. Plus, when you figure the natives over there are real superstitious and scared to go out at night, they're not likely to be seen very often. Example, did you know panthers are still alive in Florida? Panthers, like the big cat. How many have ever seen one? alive in the wild. I've lived here 11 years. I've seen one, and it was dead on the highway. <laughs> and yet we've got a population of how many millions here in Florida? And I would say the vast majority have never seen a live panther. But they're living right here. I was surprised to find out after living here in this house quite a while that there's an owl that lives in that tree right behind here. I've only seen it twice in the 11 years we've lived here. A huge owl. Well, it's nocturnal, okay? It's, it's out at night. So uh, the creatures in the swamp in Africa are um, apparently about 20 feet long, mostly neck and tail. The body's about the size of a hippopotamus. The natives showed Dr. Mackle the favorite plant. They said it's the Malombo plant, and there's Dr. Mackle holding one. He says it has a fruit on it that's sort of like an apple, but, ver but harder than an apple. And Mokele and Bembi just loves these things. So they will even climb up out of the water into the jungle to get these plants and eat them, typically, again, at night or very, very early in the morning. Some natives claim they see one when they go out real early to go fishing. They will see one of these animals, and they'll, you know, it'll duck under the water and make big waves and even sometimes knock their canoe over just because of the waves uh, of this giant creature submerging. Dr. Mackle here has shown, uh, outlined with a footprint. This is, again, from uh, Time Life, Mysterious Creatures, page 94. There's Mackel's phone number there. He lives in California, and he's got a Chicago phone number. He's, got a, he's retired now from University of Chicago. But he's examining a footprint that the natives showed him where the animal came up out of the water and walked across the land to go after some more of these plants. They said to Mackel, if you want to find a Mokele and Bembe, find a place where there's lots of these plants and no hippopotamus. Because they don't like hippopotamus. They drive them out of their part of the river. That's his story. You can read it for yourself in the book. Gene Thomas, a missionary friend of mine, was there for 42 years. He's now retired back in Ohio. There's his name, address, phone number. You can call him up if you don't believe me. 
He said the natives over there wouldn't talk about it much, but occasionally they would. And there were two pygmies that he met that uh, had claimed to kill, they killed and ate a Mokele and Bembe. And he calculated, it would have been roughly about 1959. They don't use the same calendar we use, but he said probably about the late 50s they claimed they killed one. He said, now, in the high humidity over here in Africa and the, the high temperature, meat spoils very quickly. He said the natives told him that the, everybody that ate the meat got either got sick or died. It could be there's some poison in the meat. It could be, you know, a new animal. They didn't know how to properly clean it to get rid of the poison glands or whatever. Like if you, if you kill and eat a carp, you have to cut out the mud strip or else it tastes horrible, you know, destroys the meat. If you don't know how to clean it properly, you can you can mess it up. Same thing with deer. You know, if you don't if you if you shoot a deer, you don't know how to properly clean it. You can just, you can spoil the meat. He said, I'm not sure what happened, but they may have gotten sick and died. He said it could be. This thing, animal was so huge they didn't want to waste the meat, and they tried to keep it too long with no refrigeration. Bottom line is, it may just be a story, but the native said, you know, we killed it, and some everybody that ate it either got sick or died, and obviously they did not die. They must have just got sick, but. The na he said, the natives said that these animals will come up out of the river if, the, if you surprise them in their part of the river and they will um, hit your canoe with your tail and break your canoe to slivers. Let me back up one picture. Uh, he told me that they put stakes across the river one time to trap one of these animals because it kept bothering the fishing. The natives were going into this one lake to go fishing and these Mokelium bembies kept coming in there eating the fish and scaring the fish off. So they pounded stakes in the river in the, one of the rivers leading to this lake to try to stop the creature and when it got caught tangled up in the stakes they speared it to death. Mackle said in his book that he could still see the stakes there in the river when he went you know 20 years later. So the story he thinks is is true. Jean, or Marcelina Agnagna is a bi biologist from the Congo. He's a communist teacher there, teaches in the communist school. He says he saw one in 1983 and he drew a picture of the back. When they asked him why he didn't get a picture, Marcelina said, well, I had a camera, and I took pictures, but the film was all ruined from the high humidity. Okay, reasonable story, because it is extremely high humidity. You carry a camera through the jungle sometime and see how well it functions after two or three weeks of tromping through the jungle. Uh, it's pretty tough to keep your equipment. Just survival is a full-time job. Keeping your equipment working is another whole set of problems. Anyway. This is a fascinating article by Dr. Mark Miller, who went to the Congo Swamp with a crew. And I'd recommend you get this Far Out magazine. Now, these guys are not necessarily Christians. They're just researchers, explorers, who go do research on dinosaurs still living. Uh, all kinds of amazing stuff in this Far Out magazine, that you, uh, uh, Far Out Adventures. Uh, their phone number right there, or their website, azstarnet.com. Miller said they went. Uh, they were captured by the pygmies, and they were going to kill them. And so they got these. They were all, these guys were all in this hut, like five or six of them. They got all the patches and badges and medals they could find and put them all on this one guy's shirt. And he just marched out and said, "I'm a important government representative." You know, they had Boy Scout medallions, <laughs> security guard patches. And of course, the natives don't know what it is. You know, <laughs> made the guy look important. And he went out and said, "I demand that you release us right away." Well, the natives didn't know what to do, so they released them all. That's the story he tells in there, of how they got out of it. But they just were nearly killed by these pygmies. A group from Los Angeles went there. Herman Ragusters um, and his wife, Kia, uh, are mentioned in this article, Dinosaur-like Beast Photograph During African Jungle Expedition. Kia and, his, and Herman re described the creature. They said they saw it and photographed it. But again, the pictures didn't come out very well. High humidity destroyed the film. He said the creature was dark brown in color. The skin appeared slick and smooth. Now, that's interesting. If the skin is slick and smooth, it's probably an amphibian as opposed to a reptile, which has scales. Unless it's just wet or muddy, and then you can't see the scale pattern. Uh, for instance, many snakes look slick and smooth, but they have scales. So it could be he didn't get a good enough view. He said the uh, had a long neck and a small head. Herman saw it. Kia, his wife, saw it. And on several occasions, and they heard it making a tremendous roar. Now, as far as I know, the only recording available, and I have it in our archives here somewhere, is about a four or five minute recording that they made of a tape recorder of this creature roaring at night. And it was dark, they couldn't get video footage, but they said it would go roar and then a slapping sound. 
Strangest thing they'd ever heard. And when you listen to the tape, you'll say, man, that is, that sounds strange. They checked the voice print of this, whatever it was, because they just took, turned the tape recorder on and let it, let it record while this creature is making its roaring sound. They couldn't even see it. They checked it with all sorts of other animals. You know, what's close to this anyway? What makes this sound? They found it was reasonably close a voice print to, I think, a gecko lizard or some lizard that when it roars, the skin on its throat puffs out, and then the skin slaps back. It's the closest they could find, so they guess it might be some kind of giant reptile making this noise. But uh, Herman and uh, his wife, Kia, said they heard the creature. Many other members of the expedition, including government officials from the Republic of Congo, saw it and heard it. Here's a story from the Bradenton, uh, or Boston Herald newspaper about how that there's an expedition going into the swamp again. There have probably been 30 expeditions into that swamp in the last 20 years trying to photograph or capture one of these creatures. Um, Chuck Holcomb from um, North Alabama has gotten permission to go in there with a blimp, you know, inflatable, dirigible, and fly over the swamp with uh, cameras and infrared instruments to try to photograph this creature. Uh, he's got a couple of millionaires backing him up on this expedition. Um, Chuck Holcomb's a good friend of mine. He's the one that built the huge uh, cave which you inflate, you know, for kids to get in, and it says dinosaur cave, and he's got it on the side, travels around and uses it as a ministry. But he's going over there, um, supposed to be, I think, uh, fall 2000 or spring 2001, and he's going to actually go into the swamp and try to photograph this. He's concerned, and I mentioned this to him. I said, Chuck, I don't know if infrared will do any good if it's a reptile. They don't have any body heat. You know, they're the same temperature as their environment. So infrared may not show up. Uh, this article appeared in uh, London, uh, United Kingdom. There's a website there, or I mean, email if you want to get a hold of them. Hunters launch a trek for a living dinosaur. From uh, you can get it on cryptozoology.st if you want more on that. The natives over there claim that these animals live in caves. They're very rarely seen. They come out at night, and they eat plants for a while, and then they move on somewhere else. They're migratory. So it's not a simple matter of, hey, let's go take a picture and go home. It's just not quite like that. William Gibbons was uh, Mr. Scotland, one of the bodybuilders, you know, like me. And he uh, is a good friend of mine from Canada. He's been over there uh, three times to the Congo Swamp. And he and I wrote this book together. You can get a hold of him. His website is, or his email is congo at ioncis.com. Ioncis.com. And talk to William about his expeditions. He's also been to... Uh, several other places on cryptozoology adventures. For instance, there is some pretty good evidence that the dodo bird is not extinct. The last known dodo bird was like 300 years ago. Uh, and they've got, a, got it stuffed and mounted someplace in a, in a museum. But there are some islands out near between Africa and India where they say there are probably some dodo birds still alive. So he's doing research on that type of thing. I was about ready to go on TV one time in Canada on the 100 Huntley Street Club uh, program. And... I'm sitting there, and you know they're putting makeup on, all this stuff for TV. And I'm sitting there with a missionary who I had never met before. His name was Cal Bombay, and he does a regular um, story on this 100 Huntley Street every week, or every day, whatever they broadcast. And I was telling Cal about dinosaurs still living, and I had Roy Mackle's book there, and I handed it to him. He just was thumbing through it, and he stopped on this page right here, page 256, and said, "My wife and I saw one of those." He said, "I was missionary in Kenya, Africa." for 15 years. He said, we're driving down this dry, dusty road, a very arid region, lots of small brush everywhere, and we saw this giant creature. He said, I would guess it was about 18, 15 or 18 feet long, like a monitor lizard. He said it was stopped in the middle of the road, like it was sunning itself, trying to warm up. You know, lizards have to lay in the sun to warm themselves up. He said, it looked like that picture you have there, but the plates on the back were bigger. He said, we shut the car off, and my wife and I watched it for 10 or 15 minutes. He said, finally it got up and just walked off into the brush, disappeared. I videotaped an interview with Cal Bombay, and it's on the end of my video number three. You can see the interview with me talking to Cal about the creature that he saw. He you know, describes it for himself. Down in South America, one of the largest uh, jungle swamp areas in the world is down here called the Amazon jungle. I flew over to Amazon when I came back from preaching in Brazil and was just amazed at the size of that thing. That jungle is huge. It goes forever, it seems like. 
But in 1907, Colonel Fawcett from the British Army was down there. He was a member of the Royal Engineers. And he was, had a reputation of being a no-nonsense kind of guy, re meticulous recorder of facts. They sent him down with a crew to mark the boundary between Brazil and Peru. Fawcett reported in the Benny Swamps that he saw an animal he believed to be Diplodocus, which would be the Brontosaurus, okay? Uh, only a little smaller version. The Diplodocus story is confirmed by many of the tribes east of the Ukali River. This is from the uh, book, The Rivers Ran East. You can check it out for yourself back in 1953. Colonel Fawcett's son drew a picture of the footprints that they saw. He saw one of these animals in the swamp, and they described it as having a long neck sticking its head up way into the trees, and a large body, and a long tail. Typical dinosaur-like sighting, and there are thousands of these available that you can read for yourself. A Bolivian saurian, this is from, 19, or from 1883, Scientific American. Now understand, in the late 1800s, evolution was not as firmly entrenched as it is today in our system. Any articles like this would never make it into Scientific American today because anything that might harm the evolution theory is going to be carefully kept out by the review committee or whatever. But here's, here's what the article says. The Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, had remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of, of drawings of an extraordinary saurian, that's a saur dinosaur, killed on the Beni after receiving 36 balls. They shot it 36 times. By order of the president of Bolivia, the dried body, which had been preserved in Asuncion, was sent to La Paz. It is 12 meters long, 39 feet, from snout to point of the tail, which latter is flattened. Besides the anterior head, it has four meters behind, two small but completely formed heads. Nobody knows what this means here. Uh, rising from the back. All three have much resemblance to the head of a dog. The legs are short and end in formidable claws. Who knows what they mean by the extra heads unless it means uh, fins on the back or spines or bumps, who knows? Or uh, deformity, we don't know. The legs, the belly, and lower part of the throat appear definitely defended by a kind of scale armor. And all the back is protected by still thicker and double, uh, whatever that word is, uh, curious, starting from behind the ears of the anterior head and continuing to the tail. The neck is long and the belly large and almost dragging on the ground. Professor Gilvetti, who examined the beast, thinks it is not a monster but a member of a rare or almost lost species, as the Indians in some parts of Bolivia use small earthen vases of identical shape and probably copied from nature. William Corliss has written in many, many books uh, where he gathers information from old encyclopedias and old magazines about sightings of strange things like this. And he's done great work. You might want to get a hold of William Corliss's book or any of his series of books. It's listed in my seminar notebook in the blue pages under uh, source book project. Here's a picture of a 35-foot snake that just swallowed a native. They killed the snake and put it in the truck. You know, snakes have uh, a jaw that they can uh, open up. All, the jaw comes apart, so they can swallow something bigger than their body. Snakes are found with pigs inside and deer inside where they swallow the whole thing. And a large snake like that might only have to eat once a year. Guinness Book of World Records has 32 feet as the longest snake proven. Well, Colonel Fawcett said he shot and killed a 62-foot anaconda snake in the jungle down there. The natives that were with him said, Colonel, you should see the big ones. The natives were terrified when he shot this thing because they said, Oh, no, don't shoot it because if there's one, there's going to be two. There's another one around here somewhere. Well, he shot it and killed it and measured it. Now, the guy's a member of the Royal Engineers. He ought to, how to, he ought to know how to run a tape measure. He said it was 62 feet and some inches long. I mean, he measured it. Uh, officials of the brazil Colombia Boundary Commission in 1933 killed a 98-foot snake, two feet in diameter, with a machine gun on the banks of the Rio Negro. They claimed the creature weighed two tons, and four men had been unable to lift its head. Bernard Hoovelmans, uh, president of the Cryptozoology Society, has one of the biggest and best books on this topic, even though he, he believes in evolution. He, he does all this research and says, wow, dinosaurs are still alive, and it's amazing they survived for 70 million years. So he's still comes to the wrong conclusion. 
but his book is uh, tremendous, and I'd recommend it, you know, in spite of his evolutionary prejudice. Uh, a cook from a hotel in Amazon jungle said he saw a 100-foot snake. Now, I met a missionary to Ecuador uh, back in January of uh, year 2000, uh, and he told me the story right here that this cook had told him that he saw a 100-foot uh, snake, which the military had hunted down after it had eaten two soldiers. The snake's head was five feet long. And this guy was a missionary to that region, and the cook went to his church there and told him the story. So that's what happened to me. This was in Reuters News Service, 1997, 130-foot boa seen in Peru. That's a big snake. Terrified the villagers, of course. Uh, it crashed through the jungle. When it was all done, it left a trail that a wagon could go through as it pushed the trees and brush out of the way. 1948, this picture was taken in uh, South America of a snake floating down the Amazon River. The witnesses claim it was 150 feet long. Nobody poked it to see if it was alive. They just let it float on by. Good thinking. Now, Jim Foster was a, a student of mine for many years, and then he became a missionary. To uh, He was in Amazon for a while. He told me that down where he was in the central part of the country, the Amazon River was only nine miles wide. Can you imagine a river nine miles wide? When it gets out near the Atlantic Ocean, it becomes 200 miles wide. That's a big river. All sorts of things are in that river, of course, the piranha and all this kind of stuff. But uh, in Scotland, of course, many folks have heard of the famous Loch Ness Monster. We'll talk a little bit about Loch Ness and some of the other creatures that have been seen recently, right after we get back from the break. Uh, strange and unexplained phenomena. See, to the average person, sighting a dinosaur is strange and unexplained phenomena. To the Christian, it's not a problem. You know, so there's some still around. Uh, the unexplained, you know, and they have a whole section on Loch Ness Monster, or, of course, he's got a section on Bigfoot, and a section on dinosaurs still living, and a section on UFOs, and all sorts of neat research, and I read all this stuff, and yet we come to the wrong conclusion. Here's one, alien animals, really a good one. Uh, again, wrong conclusion. In which bound Africa? Now, this is an older book, uh, I think, 30s? Let's see. 19, no, 1967, uh, about explorers who had gone in there reporting these dinosaurs still alive. Dr. Uh, Bernard Hoovermans, I mentioned, you know, the president of the Cryptozoology Society. Here's his book. I read it uh, very carefully, the entire thing. And uh, it's really amazing, all of the stuff he's got in here. And yet again, wrong conclusion. And he's a brilliant scientist and a good guy, but just needs to uh, put it into Christian perspective and it'll all make sense. Okay, Loch Ness. I don't tell how many books have been written about Loch Ness. Here's the enigma of Loch Ness. And again, many, many stories. I read, I don't know about all of them, but I've read an awful lot of them, probably a hundred books just about Loch Ness because... Some tell the same stories. You know, the same stories appear in many books, and other times you get you glean new things from uh, other authors. There's a website, lochness.co.uk, if you want to uh, get on their website, or cryptozoology.com. Good websites about this. In northern Scotland, uh, Loch Ness is a long lake. It's 24 miles long, about a mile to a mile and a half wide. Loch Ness is extremely deep. It's about... Uh, nearly 1,000 feet deep in places. Now, before 1933, there was not really good access to the lake. If you wanted to see Loch Ness, you had to climb over the mountains. There are mountains on both sides of the lake. It's in a very deep valley called the Glen, the Great Glen or something like that. Loch Ness, actually, if you look at it, is part of a channel. I'll back up a couple slides here. It, there's a, you can swim all the way from, all the way across Scotland through these different lakes that are connected, lakes and rivers. Loch Ness is connected to the ocean uh, via a river. Uh, look at the north end there. You can see the little river goes up to the small town of Inverness. It's seven miles from this little town, which has about 20,000 people, seven miles up to Loch Ness. If you've ever taken a boat ride for seven miles, you know how monotonous that can be because boats typically don't go real fast. But about the only access to this lake was go up the river seven miles, and that's just to get to the end of the lake. You want to go 24 miles to the other end and turn around and come back. It's an all-day trip to go the length of Loch Ness. 
There were some old monasteries built along there and some old castles. The Urquhart Castle is there on Loch Ness. But in 1933, some guy decided to put a road in on the edge of the lake. And because it's real steep and from the mountains, that's not as easy as it sounds. They had to blast a groove into the mountains like they do up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. You know, you got to cut a V out of the rock to, to get where you're going. So in 1933, they blasted a, uh, a roadbed and put a road in. Now, you did not have to go over the mountains to get to Loch Ness. You could just drive along the edge of it. Nice, curvy, windy, scenic tour. This uh, picture shows the Loch Ness Road from the other side, as my drawing did on the last one. This author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings, 3,000 of them recorded. Now, in 1933, when the road was put in, there were 52 separate sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Many people have guessed that possibly because they were dynamiting along the edge and it was a lot of noise, blasting rocks into the lake, it disturbed whatever was in there. Who knows? The creature certainly could have swum out to the ocean because it has access back and forth to the ocean from, this, from Loch Ness. Today, uh, in the year 2000 here, it's a little over 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. This is from In Search of Mysteries. Let's see, I've got, I'm sure I've got that here somewhere. Uh, if you want to read it for yourself, there's tons of books on this topic. Encyclopedia of Monsters. And, anyway, um, he said 9,000 reported sightings, and now it's over 11,000. There's no question some of the 11,000 sightings are hoaxes, lies, you know, fraud. Somebody floats a rubber ducky and takes a picture and claims they saw the Loch Ness Monster. There certainly is some tourist value to this, you know. Brings a lot of tourists in because they claim they've seen Loch Ness Monster, and then, of course, that's money. So, but the fact that there's a few frauds doesn't mean they're all frauds. What some people do is they get the mistaken idea, if they, you know, if they can prove one of these sightings to be a fraud, that proves they're all frauds. Well, that's silly. That's like saying, if I can find one counterfeit $20 bill, that proves they're all counterfeit. Well, that's a poor example because they are all counterfeit since the Federal Reserve just prints them, you know. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the... Uh, Different uh, tabloid newspapers will always put something in there about we captured the Loch Ness Monster, you know, and it has a baby like this one here. But Sir Peter Scott, as a member of Parliament, he claims he has seen the Loch Ness Monster. He wears the shirt, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. That'd be the equivalent of a U.S. Senator. He claims, and most people claim, it's a plesiosaur. Now, when you read all the books about Loch Ness Monster, and again, I have read lots of them and lots of articles and stories and sightings, they will almost all of them describe a plesiosaurus, a long neck, four flippers, short tail. Some of them describe humps on the back. Some say there are no humps. I've read at least one, maybe two stories, where somebody said they saw the creature going very slow and there were humps on its back. Several people describe it as bunches on its back. And then there were two of these stories that said they saw all of these bumps straighten out into one big hump as it took off swimming real fast. Who knows? The theories are uh, that probably, the best theory that I'm aware of is that probably these, as the creature is going slow, the muscles are contracted on its back, making the bumps. And then when it swims fast, the muscles straighten out into one long hump. Got a better idea? I'd love to hear it. But when you read these articles about... Uh, Loch Ness Monster like this one is from uh, the book Strange Animals, which I don't think I have out here. But uh, he says, Others insist Nessie must be a plesiosaur. One thing wrong with this theory is that plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. Now hold it. There's nothing wrong with the theory. There's something wrong with his prejudice because he's already decided he believes in evolution. Arthur Grant is a veterinarian student. He nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle one night. 1.30 or 1.40 in the morning, he's driving down this, uh, this new highway there in 1934. The road's just been in for a year. And Nessie scooted across the road in front of his motorcycle. Now, the guy's a veterinarian student. He ought to know something about animals. So he drew this sketch after the sighting. He said it moved very clumsy like a seal with flippers. Here's the sketch he drew of Loch Ness Monster. Alexander Campbell is the game warden, was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said he saw it 18 times, and it looks like that. That was from his 1934 sighting, shortly after the road was put in. 
cages have been built. They've baited the traps with everything you can imagine and some stuff you cannot imagine, trying to capture this creature into the traps. They've tried all sorts of things to get Loch Ness Monster. You have to understand, Loch Ness is a huge lake. It's big enough that everybody in the world could go drowned in it at the same time. It would hold the entire world's population of 6 billion people would fit in that lake. And it is very black water. Uh, it is, it's got so much suspended peat particles in it. Here is a bottle of water from Loch Ness. Because it's in a valley between uh, these mountains, when it rains, uh, especially peat, which is partially decayed plant material, washes off into the water and very, very slowly sinks to the bottom. Any little movement or storms or disturbance, you know, makes the water muddy, like a mud puddle. I'll pass this around. If you shake it up, you can see all the stuff floating in here, the suspended peat particles. That is what the whole lake is like. Now, if you get enough of that stuff together, you get six or eight or ten feet, it eventually blocks all the light. And so the top six feet might be fairly clear, and the deeper you go, the darker it gets, and you get down six, eight, ten feet, and it's black. Sunlight can't penetrate through all that stuff floating around. And so you've got a lake nearly 1,000 feet deep of pitch black. You can't see anything. There's just too much stuff floating in the water, just like a mud puddle. Shine a flashlight into a mud puddle sometime, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The light just simply won't penetrate. Many sketches have been drawn of this creature. The Spicer family said they saw it uh, with a sheep in its mouth, headed back for the lake. Um, one guy heard a disturbance in the water. He had some friends hold torches, and he went out there and took a picture, uh, and he got a picture of a hump and a neck. Off to the uh, right, you can see the neck sticking out. Now, when they republished this picture in Reader's Digest, they cut the head off. You know how they crop pictures to make them fit? All you see here is the back. In the Reader's Digest, uh, well, Reader's Digest abridged version, <laughs> they cut the head off of the creature. McLeod said he watched it through binoculars uh, for 10 minutes. Tim Dinsdale, the author of this book, Loch Ness Monster, which is still on the shelf in there, uh, Tim Dinsdale was an engineer from England or London, I believe. He went and saw the Loch Ness Monster. He said he videotaped it for several, for like a minute, or filmed, filmed it with a film. It was great distance. It was zigzagging back and forth across the lake. He took the film to the, uh, I believe it was the military, uh, the Royal Air Force, the guys who analyze film, you know, like high altitude phot photography. And they said it's definitely an animate object, the living object. And Tim got so excited about what he saw that he quit his job, bought a boat, and went and lived on Loch Ness. He wanted to see it again that bad dedicated the rest of his life to researching, interviewing people who've seen it, gathering information. Uh, to my knowledge, he never saw it again. But uh, he's written several books. He just died here several years ago. But he wrote several books on the Loch Ness Monster. He describes, for instance, Torquil McLeod, who watched the critter for nine minutes through binoculars and drew those sketches. McLeod, after watching it nine minutes, said, I think Loch Ness Monster looks like this. Uh, many people have drawn sketches. Some people say it has... Uh, horns or tubes on its head. All sorts of speculation is about this. Most people do not describe anything on its head. A few say it's got bumps sticking up and they think there might be retractable breathing tubes, you know, like a snail's eyes. His eyes will stick up and when you touch them, they go back down on his head. There's all sorts of guesses on this. Nobody knows for sure what it is. But World Book Encyclopedia put a submarine in Loch Ness. They brought the submarine from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dan Taylor built it and they brought the sub over there put it in the lake. There have been three submarine attempts. They've tried white ones, yellow ones, and I think red ones were the other. It's in one of these books here about uh, to capture, to see the Loch Ness Monster. Dan Taylor went down in his sub, and here's what he said. Uh, he said uh, he now lives in Hardyville, South Carolina. He said, Nessie is pretty elusive. I thought I got her. Something was lying on the bottom, and the wash from it threw my submarine way off course. He's going along and something huge took off and the, the backwash from it through his submarine, turned his submarine around. Website, uh, nessaproject.com. If you want to see, he's building another sub right now to go over there again. Now, he's getting to be an old man, but he has just devoted his life to this. 
He is so convinced there's something in there. The Japanese came over and put 24 boats in Loch Ness and drove the entire length of the lake with sonar. All of them had sonar devices. And as far as anybody knows, that's the first time the bottom of Loch Ness was scanned, continuous scan of sonar. They said the bottom of Loch Ness is wrinkled up like a raisin. There are many places to hide, and I'm sure Nessie heard 24 boats coming down the lake. <laughs> water tra sound travels real good underwater. There appear to be caves off to the side up into the mountains. Some have speculated that there might even be what's called an airlock, where the creature could go from the lake up into a cave in a mountain and then back down into the ocean. So the, you know, the water wouldn't be transferred back and forth because same thing as the toilet, you know, with the, the siphon on a toilet. But there could be a, a mechanism of getting back and forth. You certainly can swim out the Inverness River, except there, there are uh, locks and dams in the way now. But even then, you could still get out. Uh, one guy did get a picture of a giant diamond-shaped flipper. Uh, the Ac Academy of Applied Science, 1972, um, got this picture. Uh, Rhines, I think his name was. Uh, it's been a while since I read that story. But he said he, he dropped a weight down where the water was only 80 feet deep and it had a float on the top. And he attached uh, cameras that were sonar activated. And he put sonar device down there. So if anything swims in front of the camera, it'll trigger the camera to, to take pictures and flashes to go off. <laughs> Understand this is extremely dirty water, as you can see from the example there. And so the, the images here are computer enhanced from the images that he got with his film uh, because of the, the murkiness of the water. But again, it, it appeared to have diamond-shaped flippers. There's a fa fairly famous picture here from Reader's Digest showing Nessie with its mouth open. Many pe people describe humps. The surgeon's photo is interesting. They claim it was faked, and it certainly could have been. I don't know. But the story goes that a London surgeon was down there at Loch Ness with his mistress. And so he took this picture of Loch Ness Monster and didn't want his name associated with it because his wife is going to start asking questions. Where were you this weekend? Well, he was down at Loch Ness with his girlfriend. Anyway, that's how the story goes. But his nephew was dying, and somebody said they heard the nephew say on his deathbed that the whole thing was a fake, that they made a rubber toy and floated it and took the pictures to make it look like Loch Ness Monster so he could become famous. The story may be true. I don't know. But the last guy who could have known died. So there's no way to verify the story either way. I don't know who's telling the truth. But there are other lakes besides Loch Ness. There are several other lakes in Scotland describing creatures like this. And I don't have any of the books here, but I've read books about uh, Morgwar and uh, other lakes over there. Let's see, there's the uh, Loch uh, Morar, Loch Shiel, Loch Lochie, Loch Ness, Loch Archaic. And many have legends about a creature similar to this. The uh, Morgwar is the Cornish sea serpent, uh, the part of uh, England sticking out down there at the bottom left-hand corner. Something's been seen there. These two pictures here show the neck in different positions. Now, a series of photos is always good to show any movement. And you can see the neck is indeed straightening out. This was a long-distance shot, and so, you know, the picture's kind of blurry. People say, well, if there's a Loch Ness Monster, why doesn't somebody get a good picture? That's a fair question. I, first of all, I think some fairly good pictures have been taken. Secondly, I would ask you the question, how many of you have ever seen a car accident? You watched it happen. I have probably seen a hundred of them. We saw 50 in one day in an ice storm up in Wisconsin. Watched them happen all around us. We watched them going on like crazy. Um, I'd like you, somebody to get me a picture of a car wreck as it happens. Even if your camera is sitting there beside you, which it probably isn't. When the accident happens, you won't think in time to get the camera, focus it in, and take a picture. And even when you have a camera with you, when you see Loch Ness Monster, it's like, wow, what have I, and then it's gone and it's too late, you don't get a picture. So, English Channel has reported something like this, the English Channel Sea Serpent. A sea dragon was listed in an old dictionary somebody sent me. We think the dictionary was 1766. The cover and first four pages were torn off. So we don't know, but I've got it in the office there. Um, the dictionary reported, though, a marine monster caught in England in 1749 called a sea dragon, resembling in some degree an alligator but having two large fins which served for swimming or flying. It had two legs terminating in hoofs like those of an ass. Its body was covered with impenetrable scales. It had five rows of teeth. 
Now, a shark, pan over here, Steve, if you would. A shark has quite a few rows of teeth. Here is a uh, shark's jaw, and you can notice in the back all these different rows of teeth, immature teeth that are getting ready to flip up, or when the shark gets ready to bite something, he will uh, puff up his jaws so a bunch of these teeth dig in at the same time. Some have speculated that the creature may be uh, in the shark family because of the extra rows of teeth. I don't know. All I can do is uh, speculate like everybody else and say there's something interesting over there. They describe the creature as having these five rows of teeth. Here's a picture of the one taken on the beach in Normandy, France in 1925. This appeared in Time magazine in 1934. The 25-foot creature washed up on the beach in Normandy, France, <clears throat> 1934. Two professors from Paris Natural History Museum analyzed the creature and said it was definitely not a whale, not a sea cow. It's possible we are in the presence of an unknown species, is what they said. There's a man standing there for scale. You can see the size of this creature next to whatever, or man next to whatever this creature was. Uh, down in Brazil in 1905, uh, this creature was seen by some scientists on board a ship called the uh, Valhalla, or Valhalla, cruising off the coast of Brazil, they spotted a dorsal fin six feet long, two feet high, and a small head on a neck about seven or eight feet long in front of the fin. The creature's color was mainly dark brown, turning white on the underside, and a good-sized body could be seen under the water. Two observers were two ex the observers were two experienced British naturalists, and they published their story in a book called The Proceedings back in 1905. Down by New Zealand, a Japanese fishing boat pulled this creature up in 1977. They said it was 32 feet long, weighed 4,000 pounds. They were dragging their net 900 feet down because right off the coast of New Zealand is a place called the Chatham Rise where the Japanese do a lot of fishing because the water is only 900 feet deep, which sounds deep, I know, but compared to the rest of the ocean, which is 12,000 feet deep, this is not much. They said the creature was rotting and it stunk and it smelled terrible, so they threw it back. But they did take quite a few photos of it, and they um, saved some of the tissue. When they picked it up with the net and tried to set it down, it broke in half, and white pus oozed out everywhere. So it had been dead for some time, maybe even uh, more than a week it had been dead. The zoologist on board the, the ship, and this was a giant fishing boat, the zoologist on board drew this sketch and said that's what it looked like. Four flippers, long neck, long tail with all the Japanese writing on there. They made a special stamp for Japanese mail <clears throat> that year, 1977. They said it's the greatest find in 100 years of Japanese science. And that's a commemorative stamp. Now, the, shark, or the, the tissue that was kept was analyzed, and they did a protein analysis. And they said it was 96, I believe, 96% similar to shark protein. And so some of the American skeptics said, see, it's not a dinosaur, it's just, or not a plesiosaur. And some people get after me for calling it a dinosaur because it's actually a marine reptile. Well, I understand. But look up any book on dinosaurs. You'll find plesiosaurs listed in there. Uh, every kid thinks it's in the dinosaur family. But they said it's 96% similar to shark protein. And they said, see, it was just a basking shark. The excuse they always give for these creatures is they say it's just a basking shark, which is a monstrous shark. And when it dies, they say the gills rot and fall off, the flippers fall apart, and it ends up looking like it has four flippers and a long neck, when actually that's just his spinal cord and the gills are gone. I've read all that stuff. I've heard all that stuff many times. The people on board who had it said, look, we know what a basking shark is. It's not a basking shark. They also, when they analyzed the protein, they found it's 96% similar to shark protein. I believe it's elasmotin or something like that. They said, see, it's just a shark. I want to hold it. First place, nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein to know what it's supposed to look like. Secondly, 96% similar means it's 4% different. 4% of the DNA code is a lot of information. Humans and chimpanzees are supposed to be 99% similar. But obviously, humans and chimpanzees are extremely different. So 4% doesn't impress me because that's just a cop-out to say, well, it's just a, just a basking shark. I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. The people who had it in their hands said, no, it's not a basking shark. In Russia, what does that say in Russian across the top there, brother? Puzzle. Mystery? Puzzle of lake. Mystery of the lake. Okay. This article in uh, Russia says, describes the animal that was seen uh, in this lake that had a fin on its back. Interesting. 
what looked like a huge dinosaur washed up on the beach in Russia on the north coast in 1994. They said the creature was 39 feet long. Northern island of Japan has a creature like that. I just talked to a missionary over there uh, yesterday, a day before, recently here. I'm going to the central island of Japan, Tokyo area, in a couple months, and he's a missionary on the North Island. Uh, I forget the name of the island now, but he's, he's going to do some checking on this creature, but hasn't been seen since 73. But there were rumors of this lake over there up in the mountains of uh, a creature like the Loch Ness Monster. There's a lake in southern Japan on the South Island right there uh, where they call the creature uh, Issy. Nessie, Loch Ness Monster is called Nessie. This one's called Issy. Uh, there's a big lake over there, uh, Lake Ikida in Japan. China has one. Where some people said they saw one. They called it a USO, unidentified swimming object. The monster was golden yellow in color, had a long neck, beard, a horn the size, a horn head the size of a wash basin. Here again we have the report of the horns on the head. Nobody knows what it was. Reuters News Service reported in this lake in Sweden, there have been 450 people who claim they've seen this creature, a similar creature to Loch Ness Monster, in one of the lakes up there in, in Sweden. Canada has many lakes reporting creatures like this. Canada's Lake Monsters. We sell the book through our ministry here. Nessie's Canadian Cousin. Scientists are believers. Down in southern British Columbia, just north of Washington State, is the town of Kelowna, which is right on a monstrous lake called Lake Okanagan. Lake Okanagan is 80 miles long. That's uh, from here to what? Biloxi, Mississippi. Just about. 80 miles. Long lake. There's a million dollar reward out if anybody can capture the Ogopogo. This plaque is up there about Ogopogo's home. Before the unimaginative, practical white man came, the fearsome lake monster, Nahatik, Nahatik, whatever, was well known to the primitive, superstitious Indians. His home was, to believe, was believed to be a cave at Squally Point, and small animals were carried in the canoes to appease the serpent. Ogopogo still is seen each year now, but now by white men. Uh, the million-dollar reward was quickly withdrawn for fear somebody would go out and try to kill it, you know. But at the end of my video number three, I have interviews on there with people who claim they've seen the Ogopogo, as the creature is called. This article by Mary Moon says, Ogopogo, uh, here it says, they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80-mile-long lake in southern British Columbia. I interviewed this guy on top for nearly an hour. These four men spent their lifetime fishing out in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia, right there. He told me the story. He said, Brother Hoven, I was out there. I met him in 1992. There's his phone number right there. He said he'd been fishing since he was five. His whole, this is a bunch of fish, fishing village there. I preached in, the, in that village. He said, I'd been out there fishing since I was five. He was 67 at the time. Uh, so 62 years of experience out there on the ocean. He said, I've never seen anything like it. I don't ever want to see anything like it again. He said, this creature came out of the water and chased our boat from one to two miles. He said, uh, it was 40 to 50 feet long. It held its head out of the water about 15 feet, so it's not a fish. Uh, he described it as having four-foot tusks like a walrus, as like in sharp pointed finger, uh, teeth about the size of his fingers. I showed him the plesiosaur. He said, no, it's not exactly like that. The neck was thicker, two foot thick, eight or nine feet long with nine inch diameter eyes. And he said the eyes were set at an angle from the front. Because I asked him all these questions. I said, were the eyes on the front, like humans, or on the side, like a fish? He said, kind of at an angle. So it's not on the side, like a fish. He said he could see no visible means of propulsion. Many people describe Loch Ness Monster as having a hump on its back, moving very fast, but you can't see what's making it move. On a whale, you see the tail go up and down. On a shark, the tail goes side to side. They don't see what's making this move. If it's four flippers underneath, you know, it can be doing the flipper movement and swimming, and you don't see what's happening under the water. He said uh, it was grayish-brown, covered in barnacles, rough texture, and it did not appear to have scales. They were six miles south of Cape Sable Island. He said the water was 180 feet deep and flat cam. They pronounce flat calm. He said it's flat cam. I had to ask him to explain that. He said, oh, no, no waves. Oh, calm. Okay. He said, I don't want to see it again. I've got the whole interview on audio tape if you want to listen to it. The Cadborosaurus is the one seen in Cadboro Bay, British Columbia, which is uh, north of Washington State. It's been seen as far south as Oregon. Professor LeBlond at the University of British Columbia published a paper on it. He wrote this book, 
uh, Professor LeBlanc and Bousfield uh, wrote this book about the Cadborosaurus, and we sell the book if you want to read it. They describe it as having a long neck and short pointed front flippers, a horse-like head, and distinct eyes. A couple of pilots saw it in 1993 and reported it in Carl Schuker's book, The Unexplained. Let's see. Unexplained by Jerome Clark. Unexplained by Carl Schuker. So, they must still be in the library there. Yeah, it's still in the library. Oh, here it is. No, this is another one by Jerome Clark. Um, I got Schuker's book, too. Anyway, the, he, he's an English scientist who writes a lot on this topic. A baby one was captured in 19... Uh, I don't remember the date now. But a guy was sailing out there in this huge bay, and this thing went swimming past his boat. So he put his dip net down and pulled it up, dumped it into a bucket full of water, and drew that sketch of it. He didn't have a camera... But he drew this sketch, and he said the thing was scratching, obviously distressed, trying to get out, you know, panicking. So he dumped it overboard. Didn't save it. But there's two little front flippers, bumps down its back like scales, large eyes, and a head shaped sort of like a horse. <laughs> That's what they describe it as. We sell this book also, Monster Monster, about North American lake monsters. I talked to this man. His name is Jacques Beauvais. He's a Canadian uh, researcher who does research on the Lake Memphremagog monster. This is a huge lake that goes from Quebec down into Vermont. Or if you're an American, it goes from Vermont up into Quebec. But Jacques lives in Magog on the northern end of this lake. There's his phone number and address. I talked to him for three hours, videotaped the interview with him. He, he tapes interviews with folks who've seen this creature. In 1992, there were 26 people who saw it, as an example, kind of a typical year. Something's been seen in Chesapeake Bay Ches in, uh, um, here in America on the Potomac River. They describe it as looking like the Loch Ness Monster. In uh, the south end of Rhode Island, there's an island off in the ocean there called Block Island. There's a picture of the Block Island. On this uh, island in 1996, this creature washed up on the beach. Someone stole the bones later, but it's about 14 feet long. Nobody knows what it was, a totally new creature. Lake Erie reports something called Erie's Bessie. Matches Nessie. Here's an article from the Pensacola News Journal back in 1990 where they describe the creature as being 35 feet long, black, having a snake-like head. Um, boaters spot the Erie Monster from here on Ohio Associated Press. Serpent-like creature makes Lake Erie its home. And you can read books on it and watch my videotape on that. I talked to John Kraft, who saw and photographed the Lake Erie Monster. My interview with him is on the end of tape number three. He said, Mr. Hoven, I was going to video, I was going to photograph the sunset. I was there with my wife and... I think it was her brother and his wife or something like that. But he said, I was getting the camera set up, and they said, what is that? And we looked over, and at first we thought it was a 100 men swimming in a row, having a race. And we thought, boy, it's getting almost dark. It's getting kind of late to be swimming in Lake Erie. But then it stuck its head up. He said, by the time he got his camera put together and focused in, the head was down. All he got was the back. He said, sorry, that's the best I got right there. I showed him my plesiosaur model. He said, no, it's not quite like that. The neck was a little shorter. Pete Peterson is a taxidermist who lives on Lake Erie. People catch fish. He stuffs them and mounts them. He was walking on the beach in Lake Erie and found this creature. Seagulls were pecking at it. He took it down, took it home, stuffed it and mounted it. He said, I don't know what it is. You tell me. Carl Bob bought it off him, took it down to Glen Rose, Texas. When they did a CAT scan of it, and an x-ray, and now they're doing a DNA analysis, they found there's a fish hook stuck in the head. So apparently it got caught sometime and broke the line or something. The fish hook is still up, stuck in its head. Um, nobody knows what the creature is. Situate Harbor, I stopped there and saw the uh, people who saw were the first ones to see the Situate Harbor monster. 1970, this critter washed up on the beach. I talked to the sheriff, who was the first one there on the scene. It, it washed up at 2 in the morning. It stunk terribly. You could smell it for three miles. So the sheriff was called. He went out there to see what the stink was, and it's this 50-foot-long creature laying on the beach. As soon as uh, a rock radio station heard about it, they started announcing at 2 a.m., hey, there's a sea monster washed up on the beach in Situate Harbor. And people came down for miles, and all the highways and streets were blocked for miles, people trying to get to see the sea monster at 3 a.m. Anyway, everybody brought hatchets and machetes, or most of them did, and started cutting off pieces and taking it home so they could have a piece of the sea monster. By the time they got some pictures of it, it was all chopped up. 
the health department came out and said, we don't care what it is, it stinks, it's dangerous to contaminate the community, so they blew it back into the water with dynamite. But uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic people, scientists, came down and cut the head off and took it back in a dump truck. The head filled a dump truck. They analyzed it, the protein, and said it's a basking shark. Again, they always call them a basking shark. That's their standard answer. I doubt that duels will be fought on the proper name of, for the monster, with the experts at Woods Hole stating it's a basking shark and Dr. John Hannon positively refusing to accept anything but a real sea serpent. Edward Rowe Snow wrote a lot about the creature since uh, he lived there in that area. On the coast of California, in 1925, this animal washed up on the beach. This is from the article, California's Nessie, in uh, Skin Diver magazine. You can see the guy behind has a rifle just in case it moves again. What you're seeing there is the head. There's the eyeball on top. Kind of a rounded dome-shaped head, like a basketball sort of shape, with a beak on it. The neck was 20 feet long. I got a call from an atheist, or a red letter from an atheist one time. He said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know that was a whale? <laughs> I wrote back and said, please show me any neck on a whale. Where's the neck on a whale, please? But uh, the people who examined it, like the president of the British uh, Columbia Natural History Society, he said, my examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth. The head is large. The neck 20 feet long. The body is weak, and the tail is only three feet in length from the end of the backbone. With a bill like it possesses, it must have lived on herbage, plants, and undoubtedly inhabited a swamp. I would call it a type of plesiosaurus. It had two short front flippers, two short feet or flippers, and probably swam with its head high above the water. Some fishermen had watched it get killed the day before by a bunch of seals. Now, for many years, this creature had been reported in the coast of California. The fishermen called it the old man of the sea. You'd see it swimming around with its head up. Right off the coast of Monterey, let me back up a couple of slides here and show you. Right off the coast of California there, you go out a couple miles and it drops off into a trench. The water is incredibly deep. I think more than 10,000 feet. And that's where this creature was seen. Um, and it washed up after these seals went out and killed it one day, a big war between a bunch of seals and this big creature. It washed up on the beach a day or two later. But in the 1930s and 40s, other creatures were seen by the Monterey Sardine Fleet. At that time, that was the sardine capital of the world. One crew with 12 men watched it. Here's their report. They said it uh, stared at them with large, baleful eyes from a rounded head that topped a long, slender neck that stuck out of the water a distance of eight or more feet. And there's another book about California's sea monsters, if you want to get it from CSC. Um, there's just so much material, like, for instance, the White River Monster in Newport, Arkansas. I interviewed folks who saw it. The man who took that picture is uh, Clois Warren. I talked to Clois on the phone. He said, look, I had a whole roll of pictures taken of that creature. I took them down to the newspaper office and said, here, you've been laughing at us for saying there's something in this lake. Here's still in the roll. You develop it. Well, some idiot at the newspaper office didn't realize this was color film, and he developed it with black and white developer and ruined the entire role. So they called Kleist and said, oops, uh, sorry. Anyway, he said, this other picture I got's not nearly as good. But you can see the body at the far right, kind of a big body, and then a bunch of bumps on its back. Kleist and everybody else who saw it claims it's a, probably a basilosaurus or a zooglodon or something similar to that with bumps on its back, two front flippers. Uh, most people would say an extinct dinosaur, but apparently not. It hasn't been seen since 72, when they had a big flood and the river filled in quite a bit. The river used to be 100 feet deep. Now it's only 50 feet deep at that point. But Arkansas Senate passed a resolution to protect the White River Monster. Jupiter, Florida, something was seen. Here's the article about the guy who saw it. He told me he saw this creature surface as he was flying out seven or eight miles off the coast of Jupiter, Florida. Uh, John Messick uh, wrote me that email about this creature. In Vermont, there's a lake between Vermont and New York called Lake Champlain. Many people claim they've seen the Lake Champlain monster. I talked to Sandy, who took this picture on the front of the book. I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, oh, no. I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes, and she describes that on the videotape number three again. Okay, 1998, 58 people saw it again just a couple years ago. It is regularly reported. When I went there to Lake Champlain, I talked to folks that lived along the lake. I said, have you ever seen the Lake Champlain monster? Some said, no, it's just a joke. Some said, yeah, I've seen it, but I wouldn't tell anybody because you're going to get laughed at. I mean, if you go home and say, hey, I was out fishing and I saw a dinosaur, 
what are your friends going to think? <laughs> Something went wrong, right? A little too much sunlight out there, right? Um, one more story and we got to quit. In Pensacola, Florida, right here, this sketch was drawn by Edward Brian McCleary, who was the only survivor when five kids went scuba diving. Out, you know where the sunken ship is out off the base there, Steve? You ever seen that old sunken ship sticking up? What's the name of that ship? The Massachusetts, I think? Anyway, they sank it, I think, as target practice after the war, purposely or something. But uh, it was an old ship they're getting rid of. So these guys are going to go out scuba diving. That's a pretty good distance out to this ship. Okay. And Edward McCleary is the only survivor. Here's his, here's his report, word for word. He said, we were in an Air Force rescue raft. Now, understand, one of the kids was in, one of the kids who did not come back, his dad was real high up in Air Force res Sea Rescue. So he had gotten on one of these big Air Force rescue rafts, and these five kids, late teenagers, 16, 17, 18, 19, are going to go scuba diving. He said, we were bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we were caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog, and we began to hear strange noises, rather like the splashing of a porpoise, also a sickening odor like that of dead fish. The noise got closer to the raft, and it was then we heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole, about 10 feet high, sticking straight up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. I assume he means light bulb shape, round with a beak on it like the other creature we saw a minute ago. It bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times, getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Now, at this point, people asked him, why, did you, why didn't you stay in the raft? He said, man, I don't know. It's all we could think of. You know, this thing's getting closer. You know, we're scuba divers, so we felt safer in the water. That probably a dumb mistake, but, you know, they did it. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we were in the water, we became split up in the fog. From behind, I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long brownish green and smooth looking the head was like that of a sea turtle there appeared to be what looked like a dorsal fin when it dove under for the last time also as best i'm able to recall the eyes were green with oval pupils so the guy's getting a pretty good look at it he uh swam to the ship he said i finally made it to the ship the top of which protruded from the water and it still does today by the way and stayed there for most of the night early that morning i swam to shore and was found by the rescue unit that's the sketch he drew as the only survivor. I told this story in a meeting when I was speaking at Fort Walton Beach down the road here. A lady came to me afterwards. Her name is Val Bill. There's her address. She said, Mr. Hoven, my son, stepson, Larry Bill, was one of the kids who did not return. She said, my husband, his dad, was uh, involved in Air Force rescue for the government. If the president would have gone down, he would have been one of the ones to go after him. The guy was real high up in rescue. He said, they searched in vain. One drowned teenager was found. One body was found. The other three were never found. I called Edward Brian McCleary. I chased him down. He's in Jacksonville, Florida. He refuses to talk about it. His wife told me, after this incident, when he was like 18 years old, he became an alcoholic and a drug addict. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He's afraid it'll, you know, stir up these memories or something. But that was right here in Pensacola, Florida. All right, we've got a ton of, ton of more material you can read. Uh, watch our video number three and get more on that. The point is, I think there are some dinosaurs still alive, including some pterodactyls. I've gathered a ton of material on pterodactyls still living. I get reports probably once a month. Somebody will call me from Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, or uh, uh, northern tip of Australia, and say, hey, we've seen pterodactyls still alive. I spoke at Pensacola Junior College here a couple months ago. Next door, Jan Hadley, my neighbor, uh, teaches English as a second language over there. I was speaking at the college over there. One of the, I mentioned pterodactyls have been seen in Papua New Guinea. This lady stood up. Let's see, her name was Irma Wati. She's a medical doctor, came over to America. She's studying English right now at PJC. She said, Mr. Oven, I'm from Indonesia, and you're right. We have those creatures in my country. Pterodactyls still alive. I've had many missionaries tell me they've seen this, and maybe we, at the end of this tape, if there's time, we'll just go through and flash up the slides real slow. You can read it for yourself and chase down the information. I think it's a fascinating study, studying cryptozoology. My purpose, though, is to help destroy the evolution theory. 
which says dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And I'm sorry, they just didn't. They're part of God's normal creation. They've lived with man all through history, and there might be a few small ones still alive today. And that's the point of all this.